try to see where things are, are kind of good enough, like in, in your, your car accident with uh, Miles McGowan. They were close enough in my mind that my gut said, well, you know, I like the styling on that one better, and mm -hmm. it's good enough <coughs> gas wise, even though it's not as good as it is. Hold that thought because I'm going to talk a little bit more about some of the things that can tell you about your preferences, tell gr about group aggregate for preferences as well. And one of the things about the conjoint software that we run, which is pretty sophisticated software, is it attempts to make some <coughs> determinations about your importances, your utilities, what's good enough, what's not good enough. Because yeah, the mileage is important to me at the point. And con contract will tell you that. And I've actually got an example of why that's important the, to a point. Because our, sometimes our relationship on these things is not linear. At a certain point, it's good enough for everybody. So once we've done that in contract, we, we, we've got the secret decoder ring. We can tell you how much each of those are worth, both for individual people and for groups of people. So what types of things can it tell me? Well, we can go back, as we mentioned, we can try to figure out which features and attributes are how important to which people. And that can be a very useful and valuable thing. Um, we can also segment the marketplace or look for people who respond similarly. And one of the cool things about Conjoint is you can go in and look for people that respond similarly that might look very, very different, but might in reality have very similar purchasing techniques, purchasing habits. So often we segment the marketplace by men versus women, by age, by location. Sometimes there's more innovative ways to segment the market, and Conjoint can go look for people and say, you know what, Mark responds very similar to Jess, and we can try to understand it. Then finally, the most important thing and the most powerful thing you can do with Conjoint is you can do market simulations. You can build theoretical products, and you can put them into the market, and you can test them, and that's what we're going to do with your point or SmackDown. Well, hang on. I will try to do it. So when to use Conjoint? It's not a perfect tool for all situations. Um, if, the, if you have product options that can be decide, described by features or attributes, that's not always the case. You know, a chair can, can, can kind of be a tough thing to break down into features and attributes. But lots of things. Blender's a good example. You've got, you know, so imagine yourself walking the aisleway at Walmart looking at things. Sometimes if you're comparison shopping between, oh, that one's bigger, but it costs more money, but it's smaller, those are good examples where conjoint might be appropriate because we have features and those features have different levels, prices. Um, if you want to understand the user's trade-offs, what's more important, this or that, how much am I willing to pay or if the market is complex or segmented. Conjoint is not an appropriate discovery research tool. There's, there's never been an innovative feature in the world that has been discovered with Conjoint because you have to set your features beforehand. Um, my caution, too, is that it appeals to me because I'm kind of a data wonk, but it's a numbers intensive process. So if spreadsheets and numbers kind of freak you out, then it's probably a bad approach. And by its very nature, it makes simplifications in the marketplace. You know, we have a uh, programmable blender versus a non-programmable blender in no way gets to, was it a well-done programmable blender? Was it an interface that I enjoyed? Now, is a modern aesthetic better? What if it's a really poorly done modern aesthetic versus a funky aesthetic? So there's some real simplifications that need to be made that you need to be aware of. So real quickly, the fundamental parts of any conjoint, the first step is selecting the features or attributes. I selected the ones you saw for the blender. And then with each, each one of those attributes, you want to select appropriate levels that you think that can be. And that's the bulk of the design exercise. The hardest thing in general is selecting those. The software helps us with a lot of other things. How many attributes can we possibly do? You did nine, which is, or eight in the Blender survey. That's a big conjoint survey. That's a pretty complicated <coughs> survey. Um, we've done as many as 15. It's really hard. It's hard on the designers. It's hard on the people taking the survey. The, the data indicates that that can be done, but in general, if you can break yourself down to three or four, or maybe five or eight at the most options, you're going to be much better off. If it gets beyond that, it's too complicated, both for the designer and then also for the people taking the surveys. Um, we have a superb suite of conjoint tools. We've got really the state-of-the-art sawtooth, which is kind of recognized as the de facto standard. 
Um, we run SSI Web, which is their design tool, and SMRT, which is their analysis tool. We also have a segmentation clustering software. So we've got a great suite of tools that can help us with that. You take a look at the processes that you go through. There's a design period where we choose attributes, we select levels, we write a question here, we test and refine that. Once we've got that locked down, we field the survey. It's an internet-based survey, and so it gets uploaded. People take the survey and data is collected, and then we download data off the internet from that. That's typically done in Internet Explorer. And then there's a bunch of analysis, the market simulations, and formatting the results that we do. Dave, is there ever, uh, do you incentivize people to take it? I mean, I did it because you asked me to. Uh, I did it because you told me. I, I told, told you. That's what it But, but I mean, like I, a condition I, of employment? Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because, you know, quite honestly, with that particular one, I, did, I, I got tired. Yeah. He was asking the same thing. That's actually a pretty complicated survey. That the one that I gave you is fairly complicated. Yes, in general, there are a lot of market research firms that will help with compensation and compensation models. So just real quickly, what does it look like? You guys went through a conjoint software. The conjoint software we have also has a full suite of traditional quantitative survey formats. So you know you answer a little bit about your age and your gender. And I used really simple ones, radio buttons, that's real simple, but it has a full suite of kind of conventional survey questions. So if you want to couple a conventional quantitative survey on top, it's a tool that can do that. Um, we initially went through, is it working or that? Okay. We went through it, a build your own. Here's a build your own iPod. I found that on the internet. It's pretty funny. Uh, but we went through a build your own exercise where you're allowed to select the features that uh, make the most sense. And, one of the real innovations with the software that we're running, it's called Adaptive Choice Based Conjoint, ACBC, Adaptive. The adaptive part is all those questions that are asked on the front end are attempting to narrow down your preferences so it can focus specifically on blenders that it thinks you would be of interest. Well, and the, and the reason for that is because it is prohibitive to do a larger number of ads. Mm -hmm. So, we also did some screening tasks, not to, to be confused with airport screening, but indicating blenders that you think might work or not work. Does this work? No, I think we were struggling with that yesterday. And from that screening, it's attempting to rule out things that you might like or not like. It's looking for acceptables or unacceptable blenders. And then finally into the part, which is the choice tournament, and that's where you're selecting between three different options. Um, I know a lot of you probably thought, geez, am I really paying attention to this? Am I kind of randomly guessing at these things? It seems like I'm not really considering this as carefully as I should. The company Sawtooth has a ton of academic papers on their site. They've done a lot of psychological analysis on how people respond to these. And I am able to go in and look statistically at how well you filled out the survey. That might seem like an impossibility, but it actually generates some kind of nifty statistics on how predictable your results are or how closely I could fit a mathematical model to the way you selected. If you're randomly selecting, I'm just trying to get through this, I'm going to select this one, then that one, then that one, that one, it will generate statistics which basically said, Lucas is attempting to guess his way through this because the responses are random and I can't fit a, a clear responsibility to this. But the really interesting thing is that those of you engineers who remember design of experiments, the Gucci design principles, this works on the exact same premise. If you take a look at how many different blenders we had in our analysis, we had 11,500 combinations could be generated from our attributes. And we can look at, we can evaluate those 11,500 attributes by only looking at 18 to 24 different combinations. Same principles as DOE for those of you who went through that particular perspective. And what's really interesting, too, is even though we only had five cost levels, 25, 50, 75, the conjoint software in the analysis will allow us to interpolate. So I can test costs that weren't part of the survey. I can go in and test 79.95, even if that wasn't one of the levels. I could test nine speeds or 10 speeds or 11 speeds, even if those weren't part of the option. So what does it take to do one? Uh, keep in mind it takes a six-pack of beer for Mark Hunter. 
at the very least. I just kind of ran through kind of my sense. It really can be tremendously different. Um, a really simple conjoint, maybe 70 hours. The one that we've done right here, I probably have 25 hours in on this conjoint, I would guess, all up in analysis of the data. All the way up to 500 hours for repeated analysis multiple times. They can get pretty complicated depending on how many times you need to slice the data and how deep. And I, I shared this story with Lucas when we started working on our last one. It's true. We could both retire and spend the rest of our careers analyzing this data easily. It, 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 you really could analyze forever. Can I, can I ask a quick question on that sort of topic mm -hmm. and maybe get Mark in your perspective? How does that fit into our you know, core competencies and, and, walk, and you know, is, it, is it really linear in the design process? Do you feel it fits well with, with the project that you guys, you guys worked on? <laughs> I mean, I think cool. that it's, it's a very important, um, you know, it's, it's really important to have, to use the right research tool to get the right type of information. And the more um, various sorts of information that we can add together, bounce off each other, has a multiplicative effect, the um, insight you get from it. Now, one thing that wasn't in Dave's chart, which Mark can attest to, is something like an attribute level or the choice of the attributes. That's where you know, Dave just gets to choose, okay, I think I think modern, contemporary, and classic are, are, the, are the styles that we need to probe on. Or funky, depending on which right. style. <laughs> if, if, if you open that up to an organization's worth of people, you have to budget a lot of time to hash that out. In all the ones that we've done, there have been situations where the design process had kind of ground to a halt <coughs> because people couldn't determine features or functionality and whether or not they mattered. The reality is in our business model, we typically are not involved in final pricing to a great extent. So should it cost $59 or $69, often that's well downstream for where we've added value. And although that's an important point of this and it will create great value, that's less important than being able to throw some weight behind how, value is, how valuable is adding a programmable blender. We've done up, we've done qualitative research and people are saying, you know, I really like programmability because it gets gummed up when I make my smoothies and i got to reverse it. If you guys could fix that with a programming feature. So, you know, that's obviously a huge design challenge and what does it really mean for moving that forward. So quickly, I'd like to show some examples of what we can do with that. Um, you know, we can do traditional, and I apologize, I stole this from your survey. I hope it's good. <laughs> we can do traditional quantitative surveys. You know, if this is a great chart that, uh, that was done by Jared on kind of 67% said I can provide input, but decisions are made by central groups, so the, the types of traditional survey questions you might see in any quant study.